Welcome and thank you for joining us. My name is Karen Corman and I have the privilege of being the Executive Director of the UIC Alumni Association. Welcome to the UIC Alumni Exchange Series. Each week, we work to bring you a variety of programs and topics so you can explore, connect, and even escape from the everyday with a community of UIC alumni, staff, and faculty experts. You'll hear me say this a few times today, but I encourage you to visit go.uic.edu backslash alumni exchange for the latest and greatest programming. And with that, I am excited to start the special program this afternoon, featuring our expert UIC faculty members, one from the College of Urban Planning and Public Affairs, Professor David Merriman, and from the College of Liberal Arts, Christopher Mooney. Both professors are scholars with the University of Illinois Institute of Government and Public Affairs, and today they will be talking with us on the graduated tax income referendum. We hope that you brought your questions for this interactive discussion so you're getting all the facts before you fill out your ballots. Thank you to both of you for being here and I'll turn it over to Professor Merriman to begin the program. Thanks so much. It's great to be here and glad to talk about this important topic. I want to thank the Alumni Exchange for setting it up. So yeah, the topic is uh, the <laughs> constitutional amendment. Uh, which would allow for a graduated rate or a progressive tax. And I want to talk about some things you might need to know. So though in the state of Illinois, we have a constitutional constitution that was enacted in the 1970s. And the, the way we amend the constitution is through a legislative uh, agreement to put uh, the, a ballot issue on the ballot and then by a referendum of the voters. And so this proposed uh, amendment to the Illinois Constitution would amend uh, Article 9, Section 3, which uh, puts limitations on the income tax system of the state. And all it really does is it, it deletes two sentences from that. Uh, it really doesn't even add any words, but the, it deletes the sentences which currently restrict Illinois to have a single flat rate tax. And thus it would allow for a graduated rate tax. Um, at the time, let me say right now, at the time this uh, was put on the ballot, the legislature also voted on a set of rates that will go into effect um, if the uh, constitutional amendment passes. So when the constitutional amendment uh, goes on the ballot, the secretary of state sends out a document to uh, all registered voters in the state uh, talking about what, would, what the amendment says and some arguments pro and con for the ballot for, the, for that constitutional amendment. And uh, the Secretary of State in this uh, brochure that uh, he sent out, it was Secretary White, uh, <laughs> sent out, said the argument in favor of the amendment was to make the Illinois tax system fair, more fair, and there's a couple of sub points to that, but that's basically the argument. And then argument against the proposed constitutional amendment was basically that it would give the legislature power to increase taxes. It would increase the flexibility of the legislature regarding how they could set up the tax system. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about these arguments uh, in a bit. As I said, uh, the when the uh, legislature voted to put this on the ballot, they also passed uh, Senate Bill 687, and that bill would change the tax rates. So the tax rates that would go into effect at the same, if this constitutional amendment passes, are listed on this page. It's a little bit complicated, but it's not quite as complicated as it seems. There are really two sets of rates. For single taxpayers and uh, joint taxpayers whose income are is under $250,000, the rate would essentially stay the same. It, there's, there's minor changes, but right now the flat rate is 4.95%, which is essentially 5%. And for most taxpayers, it wouldn't change very much from that if your income is 250,000, below $250,000, which is 97% of the population. If your income is higher than that, the tax rate would go up, it would go essentially to 8%, 7.75 if you're a single taxpayer with an income between $250,000 and $350,000. It's a little different for joint taxpayers, but essentially 
if your income is less than $250,000, your rate would be 5%. And if your income is above $250,000, it would be essentially 8%. So that's, I think, the way to think about it. So the question is, you know, is this system more fair than the current system, which taxes everybody at the same rate? So I, first of all, I'll say I don't have any objective or scientific way to determine this. Um, you know, I, I, fairness means different things to different people. I will say in the literature about taxes, generally the, the concept of fairness that is used says that uh, a large chunk of people believe that taxes are more fair if they increase with the ability to pay and they increase with the benefits of government. And it's generally thought that both ability to pay and benefits from government rise with income. So there's an idea that higher income people should pay higher taxes than lower income people. Of course, even with the flat tax system, everybody pays the same rate, but higher income people pay more taxes than lower income people because they have bigger incomes. You could argue that we should do more. We should tilt it more towards high income people as many states do and as the federal government does. And you could do that with a graduated rate system. You could also actually do it with a flat rate system simply by exempting more income at the bottom of the income distribution. And basically economic studies show that you could make a system quite progressive even with a flat rate system. So the, the adoption of a graduated rate system isn't essential but it's one way of making the tax system more uh, tilted, taking a larger share of uh, the revenue from high income people. There are two, I think, significant objections or potential objections to a graduated rate system. Uh, one is that, first of all, it might not work. If you start taxing high income people, some of them might leave the state. The prominent example is Ken Griffin, who's the richest person in Illinois and has a wealth of $15 billion. I don't know what his income is, but I'm sure it's very high. And if he decides to leave the state, well, we might lose some tax revenue. And the idea is that, you know, maybe if enough rich people leave the state when we increase their tax rate, we might actually not even get more revenue. Or if we do, we might have to pay a high price for getting that additional revenue and that they might take their businesses out of the state, they might take, they might move jobs out of the state, and that might be bad for the economy of Illinois. So that's one objection. Second potential objection is that the amendments would give legislators more flexibility, and that, that's the thing highlighted by the Secretary of State, and that they could use that flexibility to increase taxes eventually on the middle class. So I want to talk um, at, about both of these objections. So the first, first thing is that this isn't a new thing. California, Connecticut, Maine, New Jersey, New York, and DC all have so-called millionaires taxes. So they have high tax rates on high income people. And so we have some experience. Currently, a bunch of other states listed in that second bullet point are considering various forms of tax increases on high end earners. So there's something to this. A lot of people are thinking about it. And economists have done uh, pretty careful studies about the experiments, particularly in New Jersey and California. So the New Jersey one is a particular interesting experiment for those of us in Illinois, because the tax proposal was very like what we're doing in Illinois. And uh, there have been a bunch of good studies of this. And basically, the most of the studies find that there weren't big effects in New Jersey or California, that there weren't a lot of millionaires that left the state. Uh, millionaires are a little more mobile than the population as a whole. And after the tax increase in New Jersey, they were still a little more mobile than the population as a whole. Interestingly, in New Jersey, more people became millionaires, right? So over time, it's not only who leaves, but who, who you grow, who do you grow as a new millionaire? And so they got some more millionaires in. Um, there is one study in California, hasn't been published yet, but it's by a very reputable economist who actually served on President Trump's Council of Economic Advisors, a guy who's very well known in the academy. And he suggests that the California results were a little bigger, or uh, substantially bigger than the earlier studies show. So there is some controversy. In addition, several studies suggest significant migration of narrow classes of very wealthy people. So there's a very famous study done in Europe of pro soccer athletes 
And those guys can move around a lot and they make a lot of money and they tend to move to, to places where taxes, income taxes are low. Uh, we found the same thing in the United States with star scientists. So scientists that are very much in demand that have a lot of patents, those guys tend a little bit more to move to low tax states. So um, the, the evidence is somewhat mixed. I would still say my reading of the evidence is that a millionaire's tax like New Jersey or California doesn't have big effects on the migration of very wealthy people from what we know so far. Of course, Illinois is different than California and New Jersey for lots of reasons. So, you know, it's legitimate to, to, to continue to, that discussion. The second potential objection to a graduated rate system is that legislators would use this flexibility to raise taxes on the middle class. <laughs> and in particular, the idea is, well, if you have lots of rates, you can sort of target groups that you know are particularly not in public favor and you can raise the taxes on them. And, at, and, and gradually what'll happen is that'll start hitting middle-class families. And so I thought that was a really interesting argument and I wanted to look at it. So I went and I collected uh, a bunch of data from 2002 to 2019. And I looked at what states actually did. Were they raising their tax rate? And were the ones with graduated rate taxes or more graduated rate taxes, were they more likely to raise the tax rate on particular groups? So I put out a little paper and you can, you can click there, you can look at the paper. Um, and it's, it's just a descriptive paper about that data. The basic answer was, first of all, if you look from 2002 to 2019, there have been very few tax increases. Tax increases are very unpopular. And so the states haven't cut tax, haven't increased tax as much on anybody. And there really hasn't been a difference between states with graduated versus flat rate taxes. Tax cuts have been more, much more, more common than tax increases and tax increases have not been particularly common in graduated rate states. So this is just like a summary of the data. So I have 153 tax years. So a tax year is a single state uh, in a single year. And since there are eight states with flat taxes, uh, there's turns out to be 153 years. <laughs> and in uh, 126 of those years, they didn't raise the tax rate or didn't make any change in the tax rate. In 27 years, they did make a tax change. Um, and in most of the time, that was a tax cut. <laughs> in the graduated rate states, <laughs> there are more states with graduated rate taxes. And so I have more years. In about, uh, I have about 600 total years, 592. In 498 of those years, there was no tax change in any of the rates. In 94 years, there was a tax change in state years. There was a tax change in at least one rate. And again, rate cuts were much more common than rate increases. So overall, flat rate st states were actually a little more common to make, a uh, little more uh, likely to make changes than graduated rate states, but there weren't a lot of tax changes in those periods. There's a lot more detail in my paper about exactly which states made what kind of tax changes. So the con my conclusion is the proposed constitutional amendment on November's ballot would move Illinois from a flat rate to a graduated rate system, which is, a ch and I should say, this is no other state has made that change since at least 2002. The full implications of this change for tax setting behavior are difficult to predict. However, examination of the recent experience of other US states finds little difference in the frequency of tax changes in general and whether tax increases occur in particular in states with graduated and flat rate states tax systems. So I'll stop there and um, we'll uh, listen to some comments from uh, Chris Mooney and then be glad to take your questions. So thanks very much. Okay, thanks a lot, Dave. Uh, and let's go from the uh, sublime to the ridiculous here. Oh, did I just kick off? Okay, I'm on, right? Okay, so my screen just did some weird things. Okay, um, listen, I'm a political scientist and I study state politics. Uh, it, as a profession, I study comparative state politics. So looking around the country and we use the states as, uh, as cases to examine various things in the political processes. But because I uh, lived in uh, Illinois, uh, I moved here uh, to University of Illinois at Springfield uh, in 1999. Uh, and uh, part of my job ever since then has been to kind of keep track on Illinois politics as well as the academic stuff. 
Um, and so I'm going to talk about the political world that's around here. Dave's given you so, so the, the detail and the facts of the situation. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the politics of the situation. Okay. Okay. Well, first thing, um, this is an initiative. This is a, pol a, a substantively important policy initiative. People are going to vote with the op op potential of having a significant impact on public policy. This almost never happens in the state of Illinois. We don't vote on, we, you know, we have referenda from time to time. They're usually advisory referenda that are thrown on there for political purposes. Like there was a millionaire's tax one a few years ago, you might remember. Uh, didn't mean anything, it's just for political purposes. Uh, but this one will have an impact. And, you know, we're, we're used to at the local level voting on these things a little bit, like bond issues and whatnot. But this is, this is significant. And, and the reason that's important to know that it's new is that this is going th these sorts of things happen a lot in other, some other states. About half the states have what they call direct, uh, ref, uh, direct initiative, which is where people can, you know, not just the legislature can cook up an idea and give it to the voters, but, but somebody can pass a petition say, I, you know, there ought to be a law, pass a petition, get it on the ballot and people can vote on it. So they're kind of used to this in California, Colorado, Florida, they vote on these things all the time. Even there, uh, it's difficult for voters to understand these things and it's difficult for them to get their heads around it. So voting on, on, on initiatives and referenda is very, uh, very tricky and very unusual in the American context. Okay, so that's what's going on now. And so, so it's a new thing, we don't, we're not used to doing it. Plus it's about taxes, which causes everybody concern and confusion, right? Uh, no, not everybody has uh, David Merriman to sit down and uh, you know explain this to them over lunch hour. Um, so, so this is a, that's that's the first thing you got to realize. There's a lot of smoke and confusion, and people aren't really sure about what's going on, which is maybe why 72 people are attending this talk today. Um, the other thing about this is that this is the only statewide race uh, of any interest this year. Okay, I mean Dick Durbin is running for re-election, but. It, for those of you up in this part of the world, you may have noticed that Dick Durbin is now running negative campaigns against Willie Wilson of the Willie Wilson party. So that shows you how worried he is about getting reelected. But there aren't any other statewide offices or uh, questions up for up for grabs. Um, there are a couple congressional or a few congressional districts that might go. There's a there's a Supreme Court uh, race uh, or. Uh, um, um, uh, retention election that's going on in the sort of northwestern part of the state, but that's not statewide. We'll talk about that in a minute. That's that's Justice Kilbride uh, up for retention. Uh, so the, so this tax question is, you know, and the, of course the national uh, election, while everybody is obsessed with it every minute of the day, it really isn't a question in Illinois because Donald Trump's going to get beat and beat badly here, I think is the general consensus. Um, so, um, so this is the thing of interest. Um, another thing to understand about this tax referendum from the political perspective is that this is a chance for the Illinois Republican Party to not to win this year in a year that's going to be extremely painful for them. Uh, and it really a, a capping a decade of pain uh, for the Illinois GOP. Um, and, and also this, this is the same with, with the Justice Kilbride retention election. Just Kilbride is a Democrat. The Republicans are trying to knock him off so they can run uh, an election out there uh, with a Republican, and you know they might have they probably have a good shot of winning uh, that seat if they could get Kilbride out. Um, okay, so so this is a chance for the Republican Party to have a win in Illinois in 2020, a year they're not going to have a lot of joy, right? Uh, but uh, it's 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 this is only because party is not on the ballot, right? So I don't know how much how much joy this is going to give the GOP is that the reason they might have success here is because nobody knows it's their thing. <laughs> so, I mean, that's not a good thing if, you know, for their brand, I suppose. You know, between Trump and Bruce Rauner and demographic shifts in the state, you know, this, the GOP as a, as, a, as a competitive force in the state has really been decimated and really um, destroyed. Uh, I think is not uh, too strong of a word. So this is an opportunity for them to, to have a win. But, <laughs> but it, not only is it a sort of under the radar win because nobody knows it's a Republican thing or they're, you know, it's not saying that it's essentially on the ballot, but the reason they're competitive here or the big reason they're competitive is not because there's a groundswell and the GOP organization is really getting it. No, it's because one guy 
is ponying up millions and millions of dollars uh, to oppose this thing. His name is Ken Griffin. Uh, you've probably heard the name before. Dave just mentioned him. He's the second richest guy, uh, supposedly, in Illinois now. Uh, and um, um, the vast majority of the opposition money for this campaign is coming from, from Ken Griffin, like 90, 95% of whatever it is. I think he's given 50, 60 million dollars to this already. And he also is providing the vast majority of the money for the Kilbride, anti-Kilbride race for that Supreme Court race I was mentioning. So he's giving, which is another non ostensibly non-partisan place where the GOP could not show win. So, so Ken Griffin want, is walking into this election. It looks like he's gonna spend north of $100 million on these two, or he could get that, but he's, he's close to that already. Uh, and he did this in a very, kind of an unusual fashion. He, it, it wasn't, he did, it was a, basically a surprise. Beginning of September, boom, he drops 50 million on the no campaign. And uh, in some respects caught the pro campaign flat footed. Um, so, so you have this hope for the Republican party, but it's, only, it's a very, very thin hope because what does that mean for Ken Griffin? Is he, you know, why would somebody spend a hundred million dollars um, on one election? Uh, you know, you could ask Mike Bloomberg because he's doing that apparently in Florida. Uh, but um, you know, a lot of people have been asking, and people have been asking me. You know, what's he? What's he doing? He's he's a long time. He's very much behind. He was a big backer with Browner. Basically, there's three super rich guys that have been back in the Republican Party in the last ten years. Really, it's Browner, Griffin, and a guy named. Uh, Eline, who uh, up near the border uh, um, in Lake County, uh, they've been basically bankrolling it. And now Rauner's doing whatever Rauner's doing, uh, hasn't been heard from since uh, he lost his election uh, two years ago. Uh, so that leaves Ken Griffin to keep pick up the slack. And people want to know, is he going to run for governor? Is that what it is? This kind of, it's kind of the Rauner playbook, right? You're super rich, you get bored with making money. And so you think, well, maybe I want to get in politics. So what do you do? Well, I got a lot of money. Let's throw a bunch of money in there and see what if I can make some noise. Rauner did this with charter schools. Uh, Griffin's doing it more directly with elections. So is he getting ready to run? So um, people want to know. Uh, it seems very unlikely, especially after the experience of the Rauner administration. I mean, if, if Griffin runs, he's going to be painted as Bruce Rauner too, right? Uh, and um, Bruce Rauner was widely unpopular in the state lost badly in, the, in his re-election bid. Uh, and so it seems unlikely that uh, another rounder type person would, would be successful here. Uh, on the other hand, uh, uh, hubris is a very powerful force for the super rich uh, as it is for a lot of people. Uh, and so who knows, maybe he's gonna do it anyway and see what happens. Um, so and this, so this, this, tick, or this race ends up being basically a battle of the billionaires because you've got Griffin on the one side against it, and you've got Pritzker on the other side for it. He's, he's not giving as the highest percentage. He's given millions and millions and millions of dollars this, but he's also got some other, there's some unions and some other people that are putting some money into the pro campaign for the tax. Um, the, this initiative is crucial for uh, Governor Pritzker's agenda. He's all in on it. He, 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 he's, he pushed this from the beginning. He, I mean, he's this is important for him. The, the FY22 budget uh, without the tax change is going to be bad. It's going to be bad anyway uh, with COVID and all the old debts and all the old stuff. Uh, but if this if if this thing doesn't pass, they're going to it's going to be even worse. So um, stand by for major cuts in uh, uh, at UIC and every other place uh, that has to do with state government if this thing doesn't pass. Um, okay, so so that's sort of the background. So how's the race going right now? How, what do we think is happening with this? Um, you know, first of all, with just just starting off uh, uh, without knowing anything else about it, if you told if if it, the basic arguments on the one hand, and Dave Dave uh, expressed these very very well, is that on the one hand the the pro campaign is said this is is a fair tax. It's fair. It's an abstract idea. And as Dave said, fair is like nice. It means nothing because it means everything, right? Uh, and even though there is a strong uh, normative uh, uh, line of thought on, on the, the, the appropriateness of a, a progressive income taxes, um, 
it's still a bit difficult to understand and um, a little bit vague. Uh, so they've so the pro had that argument: make this tax fair. Uh, the the cons have a far better argument. Their argument is, you trust those guys? You know what? They're going to do what to your taxes? Yeah, they told you this, and you know what? That is a super strong argument in the state of Illinois. Well, as I mentioned, I I I uh, I, moved, I actually moved back to Illinois in '99. I was born in Kiwani, uh, and I moved in there in '99. I've lived in Illinois for over 20 years with the exception of the current governor who still has time to screw up royally and or go to federal prison. Every single governor in the time I have lived here in over 20 years has either been objectively corrupt as in serving time in federal penitentiary or objectively failed as in losing their reelection campaign by, you know, to for reelection for governor. So you know, and, and we've had, you know, the rounder years of just incredible craziness and budget deficits. We've had pension deficits. We've got, you know, all this stuff going on. Uh, and um, yeah, so I think the trust me argument uh, is a hard one. And I think that's really an, an easy one for, for the no's. They just have to blow a lot of smoke up. They don't have to be, spe they don't have to be specific. They say, ah, you know, this is crazy. They could do this, they could do that. And they don't have to say they're going to do this. Because as Dad pointed out, the, the, the referendum is very simple and very plain. It doesn't say anything about retirement income, doesn't say anything about tax in the middle class. It, 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 but the, you know, the, the opponents can say it does. And they can just say, hey, maybe it's gonna happen. And that's gonna, so it's a very, so the, the proponents have a tough job to start with, right? Because it's a tough argument to make. Uh, and you know, these things are notoriously hard to pull uh, initiatives and referenda, um, but, and and the, and mainly because there's no, I mean, it's it's, it's different than what normal most people are used to doing. Uh, but recent, just in the last week, there's been a couple of polls out, and at best, the thing is polling 55% pro, 45% anti. Uh, and the key thing here is is that in order for this thing to pass, 60% of those casting votes on this initiative have to agree to it. 60%. So if there's 40% already saying they're going to vote against it, you know, that's, uh, that's, that, that doesn't look too promising for the pros. Um, and one thing I just, to, to, to finish, um, I, one thing that's interesting to me is that uh, Ken Griffin is, and, and, you know, sort of his, as a surrogate for the GOP, is seeking wins in these two uh, big races this year, the tax race and the and the Supreme Court, uh, and they may win them, but they're they're both they're 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 doing it in races where the, their party is not on the ballot, and where they only need forty percent to win. So, uh, and when you've got an argument like Madigan, you know everything is Madigan. If everything is bad, oh, just Madigan, you know, and that's all they have to say. They can probably get forty percent of the people in the state to vote against it. So, um, I'm not, uh, you know. After 2016, I don't like to make a lot of predictions, but I would say at this point, it doesn't look good for the for this initiative. I'll leave it open for there. Well, thank you both. Um, both very interesting perspectives and, and appreciate the wonderful information. We have several questions coming in. So uh, let me um, just start out with, does the state's financial situation make the legislature more or less likely to change the tax rate if the referendum did pass? Um, I guess I can do that. I mean, the the state's financial system situation is very perilous now, as it's been for a number of years. COVID is likely the COVID uh, um, expenditures and the lack of increase in unemployment is likely to make the situation worse going forward. Um, so whether the referendum passes or not, uh, if the referendum passes, I would say the state legislators are probably less likely to make uh, cha rate changes than um, if it fails. If it fails, there'll need to be some adjustment, barring a significant federal bailout. Um, and so I, I expect if it fails, then there'll be a big push to increase uh, at least some rates to, to tinker with the tax system. If it passes, 
my guess is that's going to be set pretty much in stone for at least the near future. There's no, I wouldn't expect an, an, uh, a big increase or a big change in tax rates just because they got kind of the, the, the people who wanted more revenue kind of got it. Okay, great. Um, there was an earlier question that was asked, does the exemption of low income people mean that they wouldn't pay any taxes? That's right. Uh, if you look at the federal tax, uh, a very significant share of the population doesn't pay any taxes. And the, the federal right right now, uh, you know, the, 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 uh, I don't have the number in front of me, but the federal, uh, if you have a, an income of say under $10,000 or so, you wouldn't pay any federal income taxes, personal income taxes. You would pay social security taxes, but not personal income taxes. Um, and, and so, uh, you know, a system like that, other states have systems like that and a higher exemption would uh, drop out the lowest income people from the tax rolls. Thank you. Um, Professor Mooney, you, you commented a little bit on this and this person has had sort of a comment question, which is the person says, I've always wondered why a billionaire like Pritzker is endorsing a bill that would cost him money. It's always been perplexing for me for a left leaning Illinois re resident. I don't know if you wanna expand on. Well, yeah, I mean, uh, as opposed to, you know, uh, the, the basic assumption of microeconomic theory, you know, everybody doesn't always pursue their own economic self-interest. I mean, there are other reasons why people do things. Uh, while it's a huge factor for a lot of people, uh, and like, for example, Ken Griffin, you can exam you can ask that question. Why? You say, what, $50 million? What? You, you got to be kidding. Well, you look at his tax liability. If this thing, you know, maybe that's what he's going to go up that much. I mean, or in a couple of years, who knows? Uh, but Pritzker, right. I mean, his taxes are going to go up. Um, and he comes from a um, sort of a long uh, uh, tradition in the Democratic Party of sort of rich liberals, uh, who uh, they a lot of them live up on the Gold Coast up here, right, and where where Pritzker lives, where you know they 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 uh, they have a lot of money, they made a lot of money one way or the other, got a lot of money from the folks, whatever they did, uh, and uh, they are. You know, they're sad. They're not. They're not that worried about. Oh, I'm going to lose five bucks or ten bucks or a million bucks, whatever. You know, um, so they can look beyond themselves. And some people have the inclination to look beyond their own personal self-interest and think about a broader. You know, the broader. Uh, you know, the commonality, uh, the state, or whatever. You know, that's that's a kind of a a nice way of thinking about it. Another way of thinking about it. Uh, you know, just again from a purely self-interested point of view. Is that he's a Democrat, he founded, you know, this is where he's working and, and he knows this is positive for the Democrats and that'll make him successful as a Democratic governor or maybe get him reelected. You know, uh, I, I probably suspect it's a bit of both. He probably does think this is the right thing to do. And he also realizes it's, uh, you know, it's gonna be beneficial for him in the Democratic uh, primary and, and in the general election. Thank you. Uh, another, this is a, a, a two part question. Um, the question is, is this giving them a blank check to spend on what they want rather than allocate for education, mental health, infrastructure, or whatever else? And then the person goes on to say, for example, it has been said that California state school education is affordable because they allocate their higher tax rates to fund their state university system. Would our legislature do the same? No. <laughs> they won't. Uh, that be, what you're talking about is tying their hands on revenue. Um, that is only, that's a political that's a political tactic uh, to say. Um, and this was done with a lottery. A lot of states had passed a lottery in the '70s and '80s, including Illinois. Said, let's let's make it for the children. All the profits are go to education, right? So that was a that was a political argument to get the thing passed. But money is fungible, as they say, and you know, a dollar here, a dollar there. You know, you move it in here, you move it out there. Um, I mean, uh, the one place that we really have in our tax system in Illinois a, a, a real lock box, and this was done through referendum a few years ago, is through the state highway fund. Uh, there's, you know, your gas taxes go into a highway fund by law. They, you know, the very strong restrictions about where you can spend that. But most of the most of the other earmarking is just political. 
And, and when I say political, I, I, I don't mean that as a bad thing. I just mean it's, it's it, when I say it's political, it means it's, it's, it's somebody developing an argument to, uh, you know, make a case for an issue or a point of view. Interesting. Thank you. Um, another question. What are the projections on increase in revenue if the graduated tax is passed? Do we know? So um, the graduated tax uh, rate tax, if it passed, it would start on January 1, 2020. So you, we'd only have half a fiscal year uh, because our fiscal year starts in July 1. So that would raise, I think, current estimates are about $1.3 billion. Uh, over the course of a full year, it would be roughly double that, of course, going up with uh, economic growth and inflation. So um, uh, uh, around $3 billion. Um, that, you should, that should be in the, you should take that in the context of a total budget for the state of Illinois, which is about a little over $60 billion. The general fund, which is the, where really most of the own source revenue is, the revenue we raise ourselves, is about 30 billion, a little over maybe 35 billion. So it's just a very significant increase in revenue, but not, you know, gonna raise 10% more revenue or something like that. Okay. Uh, so along sort of the same lines, the next question is, if the amendment passes, do future adjustments to the brackets go on a ballot for vote? No, they do question. not. The legislature retains its own uh, same ability that it has now to raise rates legislative. Yeah, and that's, that's an important point to note because uh, uh, a lot of the, uh, the anti-campaigns can't ads, as you've been seeing on TV, probably, if you're paying attention uh, to TV, uh, are saying, oh, they're going to do this, they're going to do that. Well, they could do, and they're going to raise up your retirement income. Oh, they're going to raise taxes on the middle class. They could, th this has no impact on any of that. They could do that today if they wanted to or not. Oh, interesting. Has, has the state said where the money would go? Have they outlined, if, the, if this passed, how the money would be allocated? Well, the, Governor, Governor Pritzker, proposed a budget back in uh, early uh, 2019 um, and then, I'm sorry, 2020, early 2020, and the legislature eventually passed the budget that designated, uh, essentially designated where the money would go. Um, I think everything's up in the air now because of COVID. So, uh, you know, the, the, basically what the governor said is there's some programs, higher ed was one of them. Uh, I think, you know, uh, uh, human, human services was another that would get a bit more money if the amendment passed. I wouldn't count on those places getting the money now given the new economic situation. And, and that was just talk. There's nothing, there's nothing in legislative. This is general revenue money. It's going in the pot. And then the legislature, as they do every year, has to figure out what the priorities are. So it's not, none of this money, as I understand it, is earmarked for anything. And then even if it was earmarked, they could probably get around it. Well, it's just, and everything's just changed so much with COVID and just all the expenses. Um, <laughs> so, um, another question that came in is, would the tax change impact Chicago more than the rest of the state of Illinois? Probably. I mean, in, in the sense that most of the people who are making a lot of money are not necessarily in Chicago, but Chicago and the suburbs. So that one of the things that's interesting and politically, I'd love to hear Chris talk about this, is that actually, I, I mean, the, the people who, will, who are more likely to vote for it are probably the people in Northeastern Illinois, uh, but they're also probably the people that are gonna pay mostly for it. There probably aren't a lot of downstate people who are in the income categories that are gonna be hit by this. So it's kind of interesting that the, the politics don't ally that well with, with self-interest here. Yeah, it's it's true, and and that this is a situation where partisanship in, in is really overriding uh, self and and partisanship, which is so much, you know, collinear these days with uh, rural urban living, uh, with uh, you know, with uh, education, with race. I mean, it's hard to sort these things out. For example, uh, Donald Trump is extremely popular downstate. If you go drive around anywhere past Kankakee or Rockford. And even before that, you're gonna see Trump signs all over the place. You're not gonna see a lot of Biden signs. And people down there might think, oh, you know, Trump's gonna wait. That's just because they're, you know, 
they, that's their position. I mean, they, they don't outnumber the rest of the people that live up here in northeastern Illinois, but but they and and there's they they feel put upon down there. At least some of them do uh, by Illinois. It's an old bugaboo, you know, uh, city versus country. But now it's now that's synced up with party. Uh, and you know, a good example of how uh, you know this sort of and again, it's mostly sort of extremists, and it's again used politically to rile up the base, sort of of, of right wing. Is that is, there's uh, you know there's been a, there's a push of underway. Uh, it's been mentioned several times, and really, it's again, it's not really a, a real push. It's just a talk and a, a, maybe a press release and trying to get on the radio of separating the state of Illinois uh, into two. So either, either depending on whose version of this, it would be just Cook County or the Collars or just the city of Chicago versus everybody else, right? And split it up, which could be done. I mean, constitutionally, states are allowed to split themselves up if they agree, but. It's number one, it's ridiculous on the face, but it's never gonna happen. So it makes a great talking point. And the other thing, and the most important thing is if if the if the downstate, if the, if you took the seven collar counties, uh, this or this or the, the five collar counties in Chicago, uh, or Cook, and you took that out of the state of Illinois, the rest of the Illinois would be Mississippi. You know, I mean and that you know, we, they are they are they are continuously benefiting from the wealth. Uh, that is generated up here in the Northeast. They pay less taxes than they get benefits downstate. But, you know, can't tell people stuff, so. It's, a, it's an interesting thought about splitting out Cook County and the counties around us from the rest of the state of Illinois. And just, I hadn't heard that before. So it's, it's just an interesting. Oh yeah, it's, 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 from time to time it raises its head. It's been introduced as a piece of legislation from time to time. And, and it's always from state legislators down in the southeastern part of the state, there's a there's a part of the state. Uh, you, I'm looking at the pictures on here, and I think some of you probably remember the uh, Senate election of 2004, uh, where Barack Obama ascended to the heights of national office for the first time. Uh, it, remind yourself of who you ran against that year, not the one that was having to take his wife to the sex club that he got, or the one that was beating his wife in the ankle, not that guy. Those are, they were they were out. By the time you get to the general election, he's running against a guy named Alan Keyes, who is a carpetbagger who, who was brought from Maryland. Uh, he was he's a conservative talk show radio guy and a black guy. They said, oh, we're going to find a black guy to run against Obama. That's what we're going to do. And the guy was, I mean, he was just, he's, he's as wacky as you might imagine a, a right-wing radio talk show person to be. <laughs> Uh, and ran a terrible race. And the point I'm getting to is that he won six counties in the state of Illinois, okay? Five of them are centered in a spot in Illinois around the Charleston Mattoon area. Um, and that is, I mean, so Alan Keyes beats Barack Obama for US Senate in those counties. That kind of gives you a feel for what's going on down there. Hmm. Um, we had another question come in that I'm going to ask the question and add on to it. Um, so the question is, is it true that Illinois would have one of the highest tax rates in the country if this were to pass? But then my second part question is, if we think about the country and politically, how does that matter? And, and I think you might have addressed this a little bit as talking about people that are very wealthy moving out of the state, but what, what could that impact look like otherwise? So the, the income, the highest income tax rate of uh, about 8% would be uh, not the highest in the country. There's a, a bunch of states around there, so it certainly wouldn't be out of line. Um, Illinois' tax burden in general is comparable with other wealthy states. We're usually one of the, it, depending upon how you look at it, because you could look at it and just the total amount of taxes. You can look at it as taxes as a percentage of income. You can look at it in a number of different ways. Illinois generally ranks somewhere around the top 10 states. But if you look at the other states that are around us, there's states like us, relatively high income states. And so I would say Illinois' tax burden is not out of line. We're, we, we have a little different uh, portfolio of taxes in that we pay more property taxes and uh, less income taxes actually than other states that are sort of similar to us. Um, so that's, you know, that's the basic story. I don't think that would change that this picture dram dramatically at all. 
I'm sorry, the second part of the question was what? Just sort of, you know, across the country, um, how does that place us? Does it change our status in a very general Yeah, way? no, I mean, I think, uh, you know, Illinois, it's often pointed out, you know, that Illinois is losing population, but basically everybody in the Midwest is losing population. Um, Illinois is, I think, hurt economically by the bad fiscal situation, but I, I usually tell people the bad fiscal situation, it's not about having high taxes. It's about having an unstable fiscal situation, an unsustainable fiscal situation. I think um, you know we'd be much more likely to have a good business climate if we had a plan to deal with our deficits and to have a long-term sustainable budget. Um, the tax rate could go, even go up a little bit if we did that, that wouldn't, you know, th that would still help. How do we get that? Is it based on who we're electing? <laughs> well, I think it is based on who, who you're electing. I mean, I think, um, you know, that the ability of the legislature to think long term has been really frustration. Uh, you know, I've written over the years many, many papers about how we might get this. I think, um, you know, the, the three big items in the expenditure side of the, the budget are pensions, K through 12 education, um, and human services, particularly Medicaid. Um, you know, and, and neither, none of those are easy to, to deal with. I don't think there are any quick fixes. I think what we have to do is basically allow, not allow those to grow. The, the pensions are, in my view, largely uncontrollable, but the other two not allow them to grow and to slowly have revenue increase and to really make a commitment to somehow get the legislature to make a commitment that they're going to act responsibly, that they're going to be honest about and transparent about the budget. And th that's all, it's a hard lift. <laughs> um, question for both of you. Uh, what are the top three questions a voter should consider in making a decision on this? Or top three things you think they should be thinking about? Okay. to make their decision. Well, I mean, you have to figure, you have to think about what your, your, I mean, the basic question of fairness, does this make sense to you? Is it in your, in your value structure that it make, does it make sense uh, that people, sh people with, you know, again, basically millionaires, that's what this is, basically millionaires. Uh, and, and, and not only just millionaires, I mean, we're talking about people with income of a million, of, of a million, that's not millionaires, that's, that's mega millionaires, right? Uh, I mean, I bet, I bet there's a bunch of people on this call, especially if you're retired, that have, you could be a millionaire. You've got a couple, two, three million in your accounts, whatnot, and you're living on it. But that's not, it's not, we're not talking about you. We're talking about people with income of a million. There's not that many of them. Uh, you know, uh, so you have to think about that. I mean, you have to think about your own personal situation. Are you, are you, uh, you know, are you going to be paying more and, 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 and factor that into what you think you should be paying as a, member of society for all the benefits that you get from uh, government around us, like the state university that you took advantage of and uh, were subsidized to go through and got that great education at. I do think you have to think about the trust issue too. Um, that's, uh, I, you know, you, you, if you don't, you're not paying attention. And now maybe maybe things are different now. Maybe things are great. Maybe the futures, you know, maybe Pritzker is going to, maybe you know, Madigan's going to step down, and then there's going to be, and that'll happen soon. Believe me, that's not he's not going to be there that long. Uh, I mean, just by dint of he's being, he's an old man, right? I mean, how long can he how can he be in there? Uh, and whether or not, I mean, I don't blame Mike, Mike Madigan for everything in state of Illinois. Uh, the, 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 the pro, it's just that he has exacerbated because he's been so successful at what he does uh, that it is locked in a sort of mindset of winning elections at all costs and therefore forward thinking, long-term thinking is out the window because all thing you care about is what's happening on November 3rd. Right? And, and you know, that's, a, that's a general problem with, uh, well, with any business planning or certainly with political planning. Uh, but um, it's really, uh, it, it, we've gotten a culture in a state where uh, the only thing that matters is winning. And, um, you know, the policy aspects are just sort of, you know, that's that, you know, we oftentimes in politics, you, you know, it, it, what matters is what matters is the policy and the politics is just how we get to the policy, right? 
but oftentimes I think that, you know, we sometimes, especially in the state of Illinois, but not just here, right? Uh, and for some people, it that gets reversed where what really matters is the politics and who wins and the policy aspect is just used to help determine that, you know? And uh, so, uh, you know, I don't know if, we, I, I don't know what else to say about that. Does it seem, before Professor Marion, I have you answer, does it seem that that has been a shift across the country too, just about it's important about who wins versus the, the policies? Uh, for Chris? Or did you say that again? I'm sorry, I thought you were talking. You, you, you made the comment that it was all about winning, that it's shifted from what the policies are and that it's become more important about who wins. Do you, it, and I thought you referenced the state of Illinois. Do you think that it has been a shift across the country too or just more in Illinois? Well, I mean, there's a, there's a, there's a, I don't know. I mean, there's a tendency for that to happen. And one of the reasons that, that it seems like that anymore uh, especially on national politics, is as I was mentioning before, the alignment of all these identities, you know, uh, in American politics. So, you know, your sexual identity, your gender, your your race, your your education, your you know where you live, all those things are lined up with party like uh, they never have been before, uh, and so that's what that's led all this polarization you have, and so everybody's on the team. And everybody only listens to their own team, and only anybody only cares about their own team. Um, you know, that's a yeah, that's a general problem. Uh, in and it's you know it's exacerbated by 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 uh, money in politics, by more expertise, uh, social media, more expertise in, in media generally, being just better cam being campaigning and so forth. Um, and um, yeah, so it's yeah, it's an it's it's a national concern. Um, but Illinois has its spades. Thank you. Um, and then Professor Merriman, if you could sort of close us out with what do you think are the top three questions the voters should consider or things they should be thinking about as they make a decision on this? Yeah, important. well, I mean, I think there's, first of all, each of us have to look at ourselves and say, you know, what, what do I think is fair? And, I, you know, uh, I will just say, I think you should need to think about it in the context of, a, of an economy that's become much more bifurcated in terms of the income is going much more income is going to higher income people and we've seen particularly covid you know hurting low income people now I'm, I'm not telling you how you should vote but i mean i think when you think about fairness you have to think about it within the context of the whole economy i guess the other two questions are sort of <clears throat> they're related to each other one is sort of how much risk are you willing to take right you might make the state better but there's a risk that you'll be wrong but there's a risk that you know what i know from the economic studies you know, they apply to other states, how much that applies to Illinois and how much that applies to the future is a hard thing to, to do. And with that is, you know, what's the alternative? So you might think the risky thing to do, the risk, the less risky thing to do is to vote no. But remember, what we have now is not sustainable. <laughs> so if you vote no, something's going to change, not clear what, something's going to change. And so that's risky too. And so I think you have to think about those those issues, tough, tough issues. Well, you both have given us a lot to think about and thank you both so much for this wonderful discussion and for sharing your time and, and talent. We're so glad you're, you're part of UIC and um, just grateful for all of this conversation today. Uh, just real quick, please join us next week on Tuesday, October 27th at noon Central Standard Time for our next alumni exchange program featuring UIC alumna Kelly Crawford, who is a certified career coach and national career expert. Whether you are in a remote job searching or wanting to expand your network, please join us as she presents an interactive discussion on leveraging LinkedIn for professional success. As always, you can find more information at go.uic.edu backslash alumni exchange. And of course, please do be on the lookout for that quick survey I mentioned at the beginning. Thank you again, Professor Merriman and Professor Mooney for this wonderful conversation today. We're so grateful for your time. Thank you to all of you for joining us in Alumni Exchange and we look forward to seeing you again in a future program. Have a Thanks great a lot. Great to, great to talk Bye. to you. Thank Bye -bye. you.